In Civ 6 or Civilization 6, there are over 50 civs with numerous rulers that have played huge roles throughout history, changing the course and development of not only their domains, but the human race as a species. And then there's Christina. A couple of months ago, I went through five leaders who shouldn't be in Civ 6, and in this Civilization 6 video, I'm going through five leaders who are missing from Civilization 6 based on their accomplishments in relation to the current ruler of their country. So I can't add another Civ, I can only change the rulers. If you enjoy, leave a like, it really helps out the channel a ton, and let me know any other ideas you have that would be interesting down below in the comments. I got an honorable mention before we get to the top 5, Mehmed II in replacement of Suleiman for the Ottoman Empire. Now it's an honorable mention because Suleiman himself was fantastic, but Mehmed was just as good if not better. Pretty much turning the Ottomans into an empire and a world superpower, he shockingly broke down the walls of Constantinople and captured the city to be made as his new capital, while subjugating the surrounding Baleks and nations, establishing complete dominance of trade between the East and West by controlling the Bosphorus and most of the eastern trade routes. Suleiman was fantastic, but Mehmed really set the course of the entire empire, and when you factor in Suleiman's failure at Vienna, not the winged Tsar rescue but the one before that, as well as the fact that nothing he did compared to capturing Constantinople is a big part of why I'd put Mehmed instead of Suleiman, especially considering that Suleiman has now been in two straight Civ games, whereas the last time Mehmed was a ruler was as an alternate in Civilization 4. Suleiman still expanded Ottoman control over Europe as well as the remaining holdout islands in the Mediterranean and even established and instituted a new legal as well as societal, societal reforms that really upticked the Ottoman Empire as the strongest nation on earth at the time. However, the difference between them, in my opinion, is the fact that the Ottomans were stonewalled at Vienna under Suleiman, whereas Mehmed took out Constantinople, which had been stonewalling pretty much everyone for the last thousand years, while turning the Ottomans from a regional power into an, oh, he really is that guy type of superpower. There is also something to be said for starting something rather than fixing and making something better, if that makes sense, I guess. Although, again, this is an honorable mention. Suleiman is called the Magnificent for a reason, and the Siege of Vienna wasn't as crippling as some make it out to be, especially when you consider the fact that he did so much good for the Empire in comparison to some of the future Sultans, so it isn't some massive atrocity that should see the deaths at Firaxis tried for crimes against humanity or anything, but it's just something I toss in before we get to the actual top five. Now, last video I made on leaders who shouldn't be in Civilization 6, I said Cleopatra should not have been in cause she did jack all in the long term for Egypt. And of course, I did get lots of Civ Life or Sexist confirmed comments. I never said she was abhorrent or anything. I said there were much better leaders than her who ensured Europe survived past their death, with one of them being Hatshepsut, and also the fact that, well, Cleopatra, in the grand scheme of things, didn't really leave Egypt in the best situation. The entire reason Cleopatra was even able to ascend to the throne as a woman is because Hatshepsut, the first female pharaoh, paved the way. Being able to secure her leadership role due to her expert trade and economic policies as a priestess, impressing the Egyptian nobility who wanted to get their bands up, while at the same time feigning the fact that she had zero ambition for the throne, making people think, yeah, she's going to make a great Muppet puppet, before she took over, secured her rule, and ensured the most prosperous rule Egypt had, or up to this point has ever seen. Her multiple building projects, and most importantly, her mission to the land of Punt being so successful, it opened up trade relations between Egypt and the rest of the world, leading Egypt to economic prosperity never seen before. Her mass great building projects culminate, culminated in her mortuary temple being regarded as one of the world's architectural marvels. While not a conqueror, that wasn't necessarily something ancient Egyptians were great or even good at, so her lack of conquest does little against her as that was really par for the course with most Egyptian pharaohs. The economic boom seen under her reign would last for generations after her death and probably prolonged Egypt's place as a world power in comparison to what would have happened had she completely dropped the ball. While she might not be the best ruler, I'm not really an ancient Egyptian historian, so I literally have no idea. What I do know, though, is she was one of the best Egyptian rulers to ever live, and the fact she hasn't been in a modern Civ game, and yes, Civilization 4 isn't a modern Civ game, it's over 15 years old at this point, means I would have liked to see her this game and see Egypt more focused on trade and, you know, building production, I guess, instead of just kind of the same wonder production Civ they have been in Civilization.
Civilization 5 and now Civilization 6. And now we got Byzantium, and look, Basil II was fine. Getting the Bulgars to call you daddy while postponing the Byzantine collapse is impressive, but that's just it. It postponed the collapse, which happened not too long after his death. Justinian, however, was both a different animal and the same beast. As the Byzantine Empire, his rule along with Theodora saw the recapture of most of not only the Italian peninsula, including the city of Rome for, you know, what they called themselves the Roman Empire, this prestigious claim, while good, really pales in comparison to his other exploits in elevating the Byzantine Empire back into really the Roman Empire for a couple of decades, as he developed the economy to ludicrous levels while codifying Roman laws and stabilizing the Byzantine Empire, which at that point had seen better days at that point and the construction of the Hagia Sophia really being the hallmark of his exploits as emperor. One of the biggest accomplishments he made though is the fact that he reformed the administration and pretty much killed corruption in the empire that really had been occurring for centuries at that point predating to before the collapse of the western Roman empire even really before the schism that happened between the east and west. At this point you could no longer buy your way to governorship and actually had to be competent to gain any sort of power. And that isn't even considering the fact that this trait of Justinian can be seen through his generals as Belisarus and Narsus being not only extremely competent, but some of the greatest gener generals the world, let alone the Roman Empire had ever seen, as the Byzantines not only reclaimed Rome, but also literally almost reformed the Roman Empire. They took chunks of Spain, North Africa, as well as most of the Italian peninsula as the only thing they were really missing to hit that reform Roman Empire decision in EU4 was France and probably the rest of Spain. This man literally reformed Rome, like he was playing a paradox game. And while it didn't last, that wasn't necessarily due to his faults, since by the time he died, he'd pretty much kept his conquests that he made. And secondly, there was a plague that occurred during the time frame, which crippled the Byzantines, which he could not have done anything against, as the plague was on par with the Black Death and its destructive properties to not only the Byzantine Empire, but also their main competitors, the Persian Empire to the east. And let's talk about the Persian Empire. Khosrow I and II, widely viewed as some of the best Persian rulers to ever exist to that point, where I wouldn't be surprised if they ruled in Civilization VII, were Justinian's direct competitors as superpowers in the 6th century. And despite all this, he still was able to reform most of the Roman Empire while securing his borders, unlike his predecessors, against the Persian nation. Imagine what he would have done had the plague nor Persia had been a problem for him. Heck, look at what he did despite those two things tying his hands behind his back. Not only is he one of the best Byzantine rulers of all time, I'd put him right up there with Augustus, Trajan, and Aurelius as some of the greatest Roman emperors to ever live, and because of that, I really feel like he should have been the leader for Byzantium in Civilization VI. And if you are enjoying this video, leave a like and subscribe to not miss out on future content, and comment down below which leader or Civ you think should be in Civilization VI, or even in future Civ Seven installments. Now for Arabia. There are some great Arabian rulers throughout history with Saladin and Harun al-Rashid in previous Civ games, along with others that most people don't even talk about with the four caliphs, the Umayyad dynasty, the Abbasids, as well as the rulers of Iberia. So let's talk about the first great Arab dynasty after the first four caliphs, Ba'awiyah Abu Sufyan, the founder of the first Umayyad dynasty. He started rising through the ranks as governor of Syria while taking on the formidable Byzantine navy, which the Muslims were never really able to compete with up to that point, and he ended up beating them. After the assassination of Ali, he was able to avoid a civil war and proclaim himself caliph of the new Umayyad Empire. While he didn't necessarily completely avoid one, he was able to convince Ali's son to abdicate, thus paving the way for him as the ruler without a prolonged and deadly civil war, as seen in the future of this empire, as well as in previous empires like the Byzantines or even the Persians. While he did change the caliph to a king, Kingship instead of through democratic, semi democratic rule as had been tradition, this was going to inevitably happen as the Empire of Islam at this point was growing too large to have 20 or so men pick a ruler every 10 or 20 years. He moved his capital to Damascus and established the city as one of the largest and most important throughout history until around the Mongol invasion. Not only was he able to save the Islamic Empire from fracturing that early on, but was also able to continue the mass string of conquest throughout North Africa. Anatolia, almost taking
Constantinople but was stopped while continuing to push through Persia. While not the perfect ruler, especially considering he placed his son on the throne, which, uh, you know, his son wasn't really the best ruler after him, this is about his accomplishments, which also include taking the Byzantine and Persian administrative systems and establishing them in conquered territories, reducing rebellions, and helped tremendously in integrating the newly conquered provinces into his empire. At the peak of the Umayyad dynasty, they controlled an empire from the lands of Persia to the east, all the way to most of Iberia and parts of France to the west, being able to continue Islam's meteorotic rise after avoiding a potential deadly civil war, which would have crippled Islamic expansion and probably left it as a minority of sorts type of religion centered around the Arabian Peninsula instead of a world religion. Think of it as the difference between being as widespread as something like Hinduism or Shintoism, mainly regional religions, as opposed to something like Christianity being practiced throughout huge chunks of the world. With Frederick Barbarossa leading Germany, quote-unquote, in Civilization VI, despite being the Holy Roman Emperor centuries before Germany became a thing, I think we can add a Prussian king as a potential ruler in Civilization VI, and for that I pick Frederick the Great. The man who reformed the Prussian military from your run-of-the-mill European army run mostly by mercenaries, and, you know, being able to win wars here and there but nothing too special, into this absolute giga-chad military force able to fight forces 69 9,420 times their size and wiping them out with zero casualties and back home in time for dinner. While that may have been a slight exaggeration, his rule led to Prussian military tradition being established and lasting all the way until really the end of the Second World War where the Allies partitioned Germany and said no more wars. The basis of Germany's insane military capabilities and strategies really stems from Frederick and his reforms for the Prussian army, which led him to dominate Austria in the conquest of Silesia, and eventually allowing the North German power to compete with Austria's monopoly in the HRE. And while his exploits in the Seven Years' War is way too overplayed, since Austria, Russia, and France tag-teamed to run a train on his army and territory until Peter took control of Russia, and I'm not joking, and this isn't Peter the Great, this is Peter the Third, by the way. I'm not joking at all of what I'm about to say. Not only made peace, but also gave his armies over to the Prussian control, pulling in Italy and switching sides, despite the fact that they were extremely close to forcing a surrender for a literal Iron Cross metal type thing. I I'm not joking. He was an actual literal Prussophile years before that even became a term. And even though being able to keep an army in the field despite being outnumbered on an average of 3.5 to 1 is insane to think about, it still wasn't exactly a winning situation, and he did sort of get extremely lucky. But again, he was consistently outnumbered 3.5 to 1, and by the time the Russians were out of the war and the numbers were more even, by even I mean about 2 to 1, 1 1.5 to 1, he began running roughshod through Austria, forcing them to sue for peace. His excellent military reforms allowed him to stay in the war until a miracle happened, and is probably his lasting legacy until really this day even seen throughout different parts of the world aside from Germany. Finally, for his domestic policies, he really reformed Prussian society and the economy while being one of the first enlightened despots in Europe, giving the people of Prussia more freedom and liberalism, increasing free thinking, which in part led to the rise of Prussia as the main German power, and eventually led to them being the force behind German unification in the late 19th century. And finally, we have Meiji, the greatest Japanese emperor to ever live. Meiji is one of the greatest monarchs really to ever live, changing Japan from an agricultural society to an industrial and military East Asian superpower, as he was able to send Japan over the edge, allowing them to beat empires multiple times their size, such as Russia and even China, conquering resource-rich Manchuria and Korea in the process. The Meiji Restoration allowed the Emperor to take power back to the Emperorship instead of the daimyos and shoguns as well as instituting reforms to really break Japanese isolationism and allowed them to develop an industry and modern army faster than really any other southeastern nation and even Russia honestly who was one of the only European nations to never really industrialize up until now. Well, he did, kind of like Frederick, lead to Japanese power, which allowed future generations to commit atrocities against China and 
Korea. It's kind of unfair to pin it on him for being such a good monarch rather than the actual perpetrator of said atrocities. At the end of the day, the Japanese Meiji Restoration was one of the miracles of modern economic and industrial development up there with the Soviet Union in the early 20th century and China's rise to power in the latter of the same. Japan did it first and was able to build their own mini empire until the United States dropped a fat man dookie twice on them. I think Meiji is probably the most deserving ruler of who should be in a Civilization game, especially Civilization 6, as compared to Hojo Tokimun, who was great, but really wasn't on par with Meiji. But what do you think? Let me know your thoughts on my list down below, and I'll see you all in the next video. Peace.